May the grace and peace of God be with you. And also with you. As we begin our Advent pilgrimage, looking forward to the celebration of the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, let us in prayer and praise, thanksgiving and song give voice to the hope set forth in the scriptures that Christ's reign of love and light will indeed come among us. Let us offer ourselves anew as witnesses to the advent of Christ's glory, seeking to bring Christ's light and love to those who sit in darkness. Come, O long-expected Jesus, come. restraint and courage to beat our swords into plowshares and no longer to study the ways of war for we look to you in the hope come Lord Jesus come by John on the banks of the Jordan, immerse us into a baptism of repentance, so that we may rise from water, reaching out our hands to people of all faiths who long for your goodness, for we look to you. strengthen your church so that we may be stewards of your abundance and joyful heralds of the banquet to which all are invited for we look to lighten the burden of the poor, so that what we proclaim becomes what we spend ourselves to accomplish, for we look to Empower us 
us to establish justice in our cities and communities, and to honor the covenant into which we have entered, so that all homes may be lively and joyful and all children may flourish. For we look to Entrusted to us our homes, families, friends, and possessions. Be ready always for your arrival, and keep us alert to the signs of your presence, for we look to you. selfish desire and fear, so that we may give ourselves fully to you, for we look to you in hope. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Incarnate of the Virgin Mary, care for our flesh, heal our diseases, strengthen our weakness, and enfold us at last in your peace. And may what is done in us be according to your will, for we look to you. your children, simplify and soften our hearts, so that we may enter the realm of God with gratitude and joy, for we look to God, eternal light, come among us. Enter our darkness and guide us in those paths of justice and peace that fulfill your purposes for us. Lift us up to rejoice forever in the life of the Holy Trinity, for we look to you in hope and praise you with the Father and the Spirit, one God from before time and through all eternity. God, give us grace to cast away the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. 
now in the time of this mortal life in which your son Jesus Christ came to visit us in great humility that in the last day when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge both the living and the dead we may rise to the life immortal through him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the prophet Jeremiah. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. The word of the Lord.
Jesus said there will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on the earth distress among nations, confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things began to take place, stand up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Then he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is already near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Be on guard so that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life. And that day catch you unexpected, unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all who live on the face of the whole earth. Be alert at all times, praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that will take place and to stand before the Son of Man. The Gospel of the Lord. A prayer for all of us, but especially those who are mourning, recovering, and traumatized in Colorado Springs. Lord, be our helper and strength. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Today begins Advent what I like to call Christ Mass season, commemorating the first coming of Christ at Bethlehem and anticipating his second coming at the consummation of the age. Backward and forward, the focus is the light of the world, Jesus Christ the Lord. Our lesson today speaks of one that will execute justice and righteousness. As a result, a people will be saved. And in the end, all will be reminded, the Lord is our righteousness. This is what Christmas is all about. God's loving intervention in sinful human conflict, bringing about a just and right resolution, saving us and reminding us that it is our Lord alone who accomplishes this. Now in seminary, I was trained to title my messages. So I'm calling this one, God and Guns, a Christmas Sermon. Please give me a few minutes to make sense of it. 
This beautiful season of Advent is marked by hope, peace, and of course, God's presence. There will always be those things that are contrary to the spirit of the season. We saw it on Friday in Colorado. Senseless violence, terror, the pain of lost loved ones. There will always be wars, disease, famine, poverty, imprisonment, alienation, marginalization, and isolation. There's also a growing tension in America that seems to me to contradict the very message of Advent. It's a hopelessness about the now and future and a fear of others, especially of the stranger, the foreigner. The response by many to this despair and fear including by a large number of my fellow evangelicals, is to arm themselves, and in doing so, to prepare to shoot people dead. I've lately been with pastors who now arm themselves in the pulpit, ready to shoot. And because my community is one of the least supportive of restrictions on how weapons may be obtained and who may obtain them, I've taken this matter as a serious prayerful concern. For me, this arming up, especially in the church, is not a policy issue. It's a theological crisis because it's about who or what we will turn to for salvation. For self-described Bible-believing Christians like me, there is only one Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ the righteous. But before some tune me out, Please let me explain how this affects my approach to this very sensitive subject. There's a backstory to my presence in this pulpit, and it's not because I'm a great orator or famous preacher. Chances are before this morning, you had never heard of me. I'm here because Bishop Buddy listened to a conversation I had on the radio about Christians and guns. The bishop later attended a screening of a film in which I explore the subject and subsequently invited me to preach today. I'm honored to do so. The film the Armor of Light is a documentary by award-winning producer, now director, Abigail Disney, who's here today, as is her film, which will be shown in the Perry Auditorium following this service. By the way, you may have noticed in the collect that there's a reference to the Armor of Light from Romans 12, uh, pardon me, 13, verse 12, on which the film's title is based. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. It wasn't a setup. The prayer was selected long ago and was actually a surprise to the bishop. Now back to the film. My cooperation with Abby's project was unlikely. We're very different. I'm a born-again Jew, 
raised in a liberal family, and became a conservative in adulthood. She was baptized Catholic, raised in a conservative Irish-American family, and became a liberal in adulthood. My entire adult life has been organized around religion, the church, and evangelism. Abby left the church at 18 and stayed away from organized religion until recently. I've spent nearly 30 years as an ardent pro-life advocate. She's spent the same amount of time as an ardent pro-choice advocate. A few years ago, Abby and I would have met only across a police tape at a demonstration. But she reached out to me from across that divide, and I reciprocated, and we formed a great friendship. Abby posed a question to me. How can evangelicals be pro-life and pro-gun? I prayerfully took that on, searching my heart, combing the scriptures, and talking to my colleagues about it. All of this can be seen in the armor of light. What Abby did through her film, and what I've attempted to do in my investigation, has been to create a safe space where all voices can be heard and honored. Shouting, finger pointing, lecturing, have not helped us to find a solution to the conundrum of balancing personal liberty with moral responsibility. Instead of engaging in heated debate, I've pursued this problem as an urgent spiritual matter, as a moral question, as an ethical crisis. I've expressed my concern about a coarsening of Christian culture, a move away from the second great commandment, love of neighbor, to suspicion of, and maybe even contempt for neighbor, a move away from the respect for the sanctity of every human life to respect for only some human lives. In my opinion, this move threatens a religious syncretism that finds salvation in something other than God. Lucy McBath, the other subject in Abby's film, is a black woman and the mother of Jordan Davis, gunned down outside a convenience store by Michael Dunn, a white, middle-aged software contractor who complained that 17-year-old Jordan and his three friends were playing their music too loud. When the young men refused to turn down the volume, Dunn said he became frightened and shot at the unarmed teenagers, later defending his deadly actions under Florida's Stand Your Ground law. Lucy implored me to speak out on this turning to deadly force, particularly on the part of Christians, at one point saying, we've replaced God with our guns. That got to me. Because whenever we replace God with anything, the result is idolatry. Evangelicals like me proclaim Jesus Christ as the only one that can save in every sense. 
Yet when it comes to moral questions about personal defense, it seems we turn too quickly to earthly authorities, politicians, media personalities, special interest groups, or even to objects like guns. I've asked my fellow believers if we have transferred our devotion, our trust, our sense of security from the heavenly to the earthly, from the divine to human contrivances. Have we traded, as theologians put it, the ultimate for the penultimate? That downward turn from God to man, from sacred to secular, would set up a false god in shrouding us in spiritual darkness. Light and darkness form a familiar motif throughout the Bible, including in the Christmas story. The light of a star, presumably in the dark night sky, guided the Magi to the Christ child. The luminous glory of the Lord stunned the shepherds, guarding their flock in the dark of night. Jesus is described as the embodiment of light. John opens his gospel referring to Christ as the true light that gives light to everyone. The darkness of idolatry presents a temptation to move away from the light of Christ. And when someone takes a lethal weapon into that kind of darkness, as we saw in Colorado Springs, the potential for mayhem increases exponentially. In a moment of rage or fear or desperation, a pistol, a semi-automatic rifle presents a quick way to resolve perceived problems. In my pastoral capacity, I'm concerned some Christians take their cues on the paramount question of deadly force, not from the Bible, but from secular sources. Their reading of the Constitution, Supreme Court decisions, state law, even fundraising letters. These are not sources of moral, ethical, or spiritual light. The psalmist says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. To my evangelical brothers and sisters, in respecting the Second Amendment, we must be careful not to break the second commandment. Ultimate answers to the difficult question of God and guns will be found among the answers to all the great questions of life. In God's word, the Bible, and in the word made flesh, Jesus Christ, the light of all mankind. And to all of us, gun owners, pacifists, liberals, conservatives, left and right, Advent, Christ Mass, is a perfect time to decide whom we will ultimately look to for salvation, a God of our own making or the Christ revealed to us in Holy Scripture born as Emmanuel, who died for us on the cross, rose again, and who knocks at the door of our hearts. Who will ultimately save us? Jesus or something else? Christ or a Glock? Will our salvation be of our own making, or will it be 
of the Lord our righteousness. Merry Christ Mass. Amen. In the tender mercy of our God, the day spring from on high shall break upon us to give light to those who dwell in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. May the peace of Christ be always with you. for a moment. It's a great privilege to gather in this beautiful sanctuary with so many of you and to mark the beginning of our Christian year, the season of Advent. And on behalf of all of those who minister in this place, I welcome our guests and friends among us. And um, on, on behalf of all of us, I thank you, Pastor Rob, for your marvelous and inspired words to us. And as he mentioned, after this service, almost immediately after the service, if you would like to join us for a screening of the film, The Armor of Light, and to have a time to engage both Rob and Abby, if she, in a question and answer period afterwards, we would be just honored, honored to have you with us. Um, you can go through the back, and people will guide you to the elevators up to Perry Auditorium, and the film will start at 1 o'clock. Um, we now make the transition in this worship service to, to the holy meal that reminds us of Jesus' presence with us as we reenact in this place and time his last meal with his disciples on earth. Um, if this is your first time that you've prayed with us here, just know that after the prayers over the bread and wine have been said, someone will invite you to a station either in the front or in the back to receive communion, to receive a bit of bread and a sip of wine, and we invite all who wish to partake to join us in this, uh, in this sacred moment. If you'd rather not come and, and receive the bread and wine, but would instead simply like a blessing, we welcome you, and you may indicate your preference by uh, crossing your arms over your chest, and one of us will be happy, happy to pray that blessing for you. We also have, during the communion service, people who are in the chapel here on the south side that offer prayers for healing. And after receiving communion or a blessing, if you'd like someone to pray with you, uh, that person is waiting for you there. It is the Christian custom when we gather in prayer to take an offering of money as a sign of gratitude and reminder to us all that all that we have comes from God and we are privileged to give back. Please know, if you are a guest with us today, that your presence here is more than gift enough. Should you choose to give an offering of money as well, we will wisely and gratefully steward it in ministry to Christ through the, through the work of this cathedral. And I thank you in advance for your prayers, your presence, and your generosity as we continue to walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a gift to God.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. And now we give you thanks because you've sent him to redeem us from sin and death and to make us inheritors of everlasting life, that when he shall come again in power and great triumph to judge the world, we may with joy behold his appearance and in confidence may stand before him. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil, and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O God, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming and glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ, and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit in the fullness of time. Put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where with Mary and all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters through Jesus Christ our Lord firstborn of all creation, head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. As we join our prayers with Christians in every place and praying in the language in which we first heard this prayer, we pray, as our Savior Christ has taught us, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ comes for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
sing together our prayer after communion. O oh, holy God, make us watchful and keep us faithful. shine upon you, scatter the darkness from before your path, and make you ready to stand before him when he comes in glory. And the blessing of God Almighty, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit go with you and remain with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen.